Hey guys, thanks for checking out another HatchetCast episode. And today I'm gonna to be talking about what I believe is going to be the most likely event that's going to induce the most amount of casualties in a civil war here in the United States. And also bear with me because I'm just going all over the place, but this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. Go ahead and roll the intro. Hey guys, thanks for checking out another HatchetCast episode, and today we're going to be talking about what I believe is going to be the highest casualty producing thing in a possible American Civil War. Before we get started, make sure you hit the like and the subscribe button. Also, if you get something out of this video or out of the channel, a great way to support the channel for free is to share these videos with a friend or family member or somebody that would get something out of it. And also, if you want to come train with us, that's a huge way to support the channel. It is a massive way that you guys can support and continue to help us do what we're doing. Come train with us. It's awesome to fellowship with you guys and to hang out and talk with you guys and get to know the community firsthand in person while we all train together and have a great time. So come and make sure you go check out the brownhatchet.com website. Look at the calendar. There's a ton of new classes that are there. Make sure you train to be an asset to yourself, your community, and your family. So today I'm going to be talking about, in my opinion, what is going to be the highest casualty producing thing in an American Civil War conflict. And what that's going to be, in my opinion, is going to be small arms fire because of marksmanship. We're not talking about sickness or starvation or disease. In my opinion, that will be the largest thing that, that causes a loss of life in an American Civil War here in the States. But what I'm talking about is man-made things that induce casualties. Um, you know, in Ukraine and in Russia, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of artillery, drones, tanks, heavy armor that is causing a lot of the cows at mines, a lot of mines. But understand that a lot of that equipment was stockpiled in Ukraine and Russia, and they had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these Soviet era weaponry that are now making their way onto the battlefield. And a lot of, uh, a lot of that equipment is has been built up for a long time from the Cold War. So all of that war equipment is now going onto the battlefield and that is producing a large amount of the casualties there. Uh, uh, the smaller amount of casualties are being produced honestly from direct small arms fire. So what are the data points that give me that opinion that I believe that small arms fire and marksmanship is going to be the one thing that takes a lot of people out in the next American conflict? Well, the reason why I say that is we got to look at our history. Within our history, we have a historical pastime of an American rifleman, all the way from the Revolutionary War when we were fighting the British, where there were militiamen or, you know, minutemen that were marksmen that were able to make engagements from further distances that were very proficient with their rifles. And that tradition has literally carried us on and still been in our culture today. So we have a long history of marksmanship. I mean, you guys can look around and be like, yeah, my uncle was a hunter, hunted his whole life. Or even if your dad wasn't that big into hunting, he still probably had that 30-odd-6 hunting rifle that he knew that he knew the dope out to 100 or 200 yards. So we have this long-lasting tradition in America of hunting, of marksmanship, of being a rifleman, and having all of those traditions in that culture ingrained into us as a society. So we're looking at a lot of the things, I mean, you go to Walmart and you're looking and seeing products that are available that help you be a better hunter. You've got camouflage, you've got mossy oak, which was started here in the States. You've got real tree camouflage that helps you to blend in, almost become invisible in, in the forest. And that those companies were from obviously the United States because we have a culture of that here in this country of having good rifleman skills and good marksmanship skills. So you got to imagine all those hunters that are out there that have been training on just hunting or have had that, you know, basic marksmanship that was passed down to them from family members to family member are now, you know, they have that rifle or they've got that, you know, that 
AR-15 that they've had for a while, and they just go out and they train and they plink. So imagine you're out on patrol, and you're out doing stuff, and all of a sudden one of the guys gets dropped, and you hear the gunshot, and it just happens to be a group of hunters or guys that have things mapped out, and they've, you're going onto their property, and all of a sudden you walked into their plot where they usually hunt deer, and they know the dope, they know the land, they know, they know the 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 target reference points that are out there on their property because they hunted it all this time or they go they maybe they go to a hunting property and there's a lodge there and all those people are now staying in that hunting lodge and they brought their families and the hunters are now defending that property and they know it like the back of their hand and so we have all of these marksmen even if they're not very mobile or understand a lot of tactics or even fast at shooting we can't put aside the fact that there's a large majority of the population that still has a decent skill set when it comes to just basic marksmanship. So we look at our history and we look at our culture and a lot of Americans have a comfort in engaging things at distance. If we look at Ukraine or we look at Russia, a lot of that population was not able to have guns. They weren't able to have firearms. Um, they weren't allowed to own those types of things, so they never had the chance to practice their marksmanship, and they never had that opportunity. Well, here in the States, there's literally 1.4 million guns being bought every month within just 2024. So that's a massive amount of weaponry that is being circulated, and that's by either gun enthusiasts, but you have to also not discount the, the traditional hunter who has a couple of rifles, they've trained with it, they've had it for years, they've taught their kids with it or their grandkids with it, and they know that thing like the back of their hand, they know the reticle of their scope, they know the dope for that rifle, and they know what it's capable out to. And so you have this history that we have here in the States of people being able to practice and train with rifles specifically and being very comfortable at working distance. We also have a lot of people who are now getting into training. A lot of people are getting into training. And we're seeing a lot more emphasis on, you know, scope carbine type courses or distance courses or bolt gun courses. So because we're seeing a lot more of that, you can surmise that a larger portion of the population, a lot larger than what it's been seen in Ukraine or Europe, is able to engage targets further away and is actually pretty comfortable at doing it or would even prefer that. So, you know, there's a possibility that you may end up coming into a complex where you may have a, a, a short range engagement. That's a very high possibility, especially in an urban area. But you got to think about when you're going out into an area like this where it's more rural or you're going out into a suburb area and now you've got or, or a, a county that's kind of out in the country. You got to assume that there's going to be a lot of marksmen. They may not be fast marksmen, but they know their rifles pretty well. And there would be kind of a, you know, imagine like you're, you're walking along and all of a sudden homeboy gets taken out by a 30 odd six at 200 yards. And so that's just something to be aware of. Understand also that a lot of the military equipment that we have is obviously coming from our own government, but it may take a while for that to be proliferated throughout the entire country. Um, you might see some armor and some military equipment that comes up from the South, from maybe South America, but a lot of that centrally located is gonna be you know, provided from the government forces here in the States. Like a lot of that may take some time to get out and to circulate throughout. And you may not see a ton of artillery at the scale that we see it in Ukraine. It may be more small arms fire, um, it may be a lot more drones that are used to be able to gather intel. You might see some more improvised type of devices that are, are populating, but that's just the type of thing that we can brainstorm and surmise would happen in a conflict that would happen here in the States. Why bring up the fact that marksmanship and small arms fire and targets being engaged at distance, why is it important? What does it mean to me? Well, for me, what I'm thinking about is I'm immediately thinking about training. I'm thinking about Am I comfortable at engaging targets at distance? Am I comfortable observing my environment and being able to spot targets or PID targets at distance? You know, a lot of times we, we always think about like, oh, if I see something moving, that's a target. No, you have to PID and, and, and assume, is, that a, is it a, a civilian? Is that someone that doesn't need to be hit? Is that maybe refugees that are fleeing from the next county over? And now you're trying to observe, maybe is there any enemy combatants within that group? Um, but PIDing things is also going to help you to stay out of situations. It's going to help you avoid 
a, a fight if you don't need to be in one. Because any time that you go into a situation, whether it's a firefight or you go into a town or whatever, you have to make a risk assessment and, 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 and calculate, is this worth the risk? Is this worth me going in there? I might lose a couple of guys and that, that will kind of defeat the effectiveness of my team. Is that worth it? So you have to make those risk assessments on the fly. And if you're able to get comfortable engaging targets at distance, that gives you more time to either break contact, to get away, to make a decision to avoid contact altogether, to identify what's a target, what's not a target. And so being comfortable at looking through glass, understanding ranging techniques, understanding how to use your rifle effectively, use the optics that you have effectively to be able to engage those types of targets is gonna be super important. Another reason why I believe that you're gonna see a lot more targets engaged at distance is look at the technology. I mean, we have LPVOs almost on every rifle. You've got a, so, a wide range of, of different options available when it comes to scopes and glass. I mean, I feel like every rifle's got an LPVO on it. You know, you've got, you know, even your, your dots and your red dots, they have magnifiers. You've got 5X, 6X. Uh, you've got different prison optic options like the ACOG. Um, and now we have with the general purpose or recce rifle, you have even maybe like your mid-range variable optic, like your 2 to 10s. We're seeing even 2.5 to 15s or 2.5 to 20s that are being put on SPR type platforms. And so you have to be thinking about like with the advancement of technology and with the proliferation of all of this equipment and glass and range finders. I mean, you can go to the, you know, a golf website and pick up a range finder. Like that's how easy it is to find that type of stuff. So that is another reason why I'm saying we are probably going to see a lot more distance engagements because this industry is allowing 5.56 rifles to engage further, to engage with more energy at the target. Um, one of the things that we're seeing now is with these hybrid rounds or these, these uh, new rounds that are coming out, the 80 and a half grain bullets from Black Arc Munitions or the Mark 262 Alpha, but it's inside of a hybrid casing. So that way it can sustain higher pressures and it can go farther. It can stay supersonic for longer. Um, you've got now, you know, 77 grain that AAC is available at a very, very cheap rate. I don't know how much longer that'll be for, but that might be something that you might want to consider is picking up more of that. But we're seeing a shift in this culture going more towards engaging targets further away with better optics, better barrels, better rails. We're seeing uppers now that are more suited for distance when it comes to 5.56. Five, um, you know, bolt guns are getting more and more streamlined. So you're seeing a lot of this technology across the industry also encouraging shooters to have the ability to engage targets further out. Um, so if you're thinking that everything's going to be CQB or everything's going to be closer to you, um, you know, everything's going to be possibly trench fighting like it is in Ukraine, we have to think about what does America have? What is the culture like here? What is the equipment that we have? How is the, we have a whole industry revolving around guns and there's a lot more guns that are out there. And so you're going to see a, a different fight here in the States than you would see possibly in Ukraine. So with that being said, you need to be very comfortable with your equipment. Going to those scope carbine courses, going online and learning about your reticle, going on that website and downloading that PDF spec sheet and be like, all right, what does it say about you know my reticle? Is it in mills? Is it in MOA? Is it you maybe you have the turrets mill, but the reticle's MOA? Do I have a BDC uh, reticle? You know, understanding your reticle and being comfortable at shooting smaller targets. Another really good thing that you can use to be able to get comfortable at looking for targets is just take a pair of binoculars and see different things that you can spot at distance and almost make a game out of it where you can try to train your eyes to start looking for things. Maybe have a friend go out and put like a cone or maybe a small like flag or handkerchief out at distance somewhere and then you have to go find it from standing in a static position. So looking at different ways to train your body to look at picking up different targets, PIDing your, your target sets, looking at your surroundings and seeing what's going on so you can build that situational awareness. All of this stuff is gonna be important and it's going to also help shift how you train and what kind of equipment that you're investing your money into. Um, you know, we're seeing now where you have range finders that are inside of binoculars 
versus inside of a monocle, and also the ability to be able to use that rangefinder as your spotting glass, because the glass is now good enough. Like I'm running the Sig Sauer Kilo 10s, and those things are really, really good that they can even be used for spotting, um, not just ranging. Um, we have range cards that are coming out from like Black Hill Designs or Shop Shack Security, where it helps you to identify ranges without having to give up signature, AKA shoot a range finder and produce laser energy down range that can be f seen or detected. So now we have these, these incognito ways of finding our range without having a ton of tra training that's required to do that. Um, and now we also have courses that are available throughout the industry where you're able to range with your reticle, whether that's mills or MOA, and being able to understand how to do that. And those types of people are going to go and in turn train their community members on how to engage targets at distance. So think about, for me, if I think about the capability that brings, if all of the guys within my team have a very strong ability to engage targets with the 5.56 rifle out to 500 yards, that really puts a huge advantage, and that's just a huge advantage for the team. And that's just your standard rifleman. That's just your standard shooter is able to engage targets at that distance because of their equipment and because of their training. That makes you a very lethal and very capable force. You know, there's also going to be a lot of shooters out there that are very, very capable. A lot of shooters are going to be very, very capable. Um, and so you have to kind of include that in your thought process about, you know, how do I buy my equipment? How do I train? Um, what do I need to be on the lookout for? And so using technology to your advantage, understanding that it's constantly evolving to give yourself more of an edge. If you can be spotted at distance, like guys are more comfortable engaging targets out at distance, then that means you need to also be a harder target. So for me, if, I'm, if I know my capability, I can engage targets, you know, depending on uh, what ammo I'm running, stuff like that, 800, 800 yards out effectively, pretty comfortably, um, and definitely at 500 and in. Um, with that understanding, and I'm thinking about, okay, what would I be looking for? What are some target identifiers? What makes it easier to see a silhouette? I need to also think about that for myself when it comes to my camouflage and what equipment I'm buying and what I'm wearing. One of the things that I am wearing that I think everybody should have is I'm wearing a Cobra hood. So if you look at a Cobra hood, it is just a, a, a revolutionary piece of equipment that is not a full ghillie suit, it's like a partial, but it allows you to wear it over top of your body armor. And now also it helps break up that silhouette. So the biggest thing that you're gonna see that's going to be easy to identify is your head and your shoulders. That position right here, this is not very natural and is a very easy thing to detect. So if I have a cobra hood, that breaks up that head and shoulder silhouette, which makes it harder for people to find me. And I can wear this over top of my gear. It's not a full ghillie. This one is actually from Karja Cow Tactical, but you don't, and this is a very expensive one. It, it costs a lot of money, but you can get stuff that is actually very well priced that doesn't cost a lot of money. So you can get one that is from Amazon, and this one was only $45. It has mesh, it has all of this type of scrim all over it, but it has tie downs as well on both of these to be able to tie down vegetation. And you don't have to be a sniper to be able to run a Cobra hood. This is literally a survivability tool to help you stay alive. If there are, if we have a culture in our society of targets being engaged at distance, then you need to make yourself a hard target and think about what type of camouflage options do you have that you can use to help yourself blend in. Um, I know a lot of different channels out there. Well, first, let's go ahead and see what does it look like with the Amazon hood. So now I have on the Amazon hood that is 45 bucks, and it's a great Cobra hood. It also has mesh, and the one thing that's going to be your best friend when it comes to this type of stuff, and honestly, all of your equipment, is spray paint. So make sure you spray paint everything. And this is some great advice that I took from my buddy Q and also the guys from Snake Pit Official as well as Sidewinder Concepts, doing a shout out to them. But all these sniper guys have a lot they can bring to the table when it comes to your camouflage. And so for here we go, I've got a $45 Cobra hood from Amazon that I can spray paint up and I can make it work for me to kind of break up the head and shoulders. It still leaves a lot of room for my pack to be able to put on my back if I need to run a pack. But also, it's super lightweight. It doesn't retain a lot of water um, because it's mesh, it's breathable. 
but it's an easy way to help break up that silhouette signature that you have. And it doesn't mean like, oh, well, only the sniper gets to wear that. Screw that. It's a survivability tool, man. Like, run whatever you can to be able to help yourself be a harder target, and that will help you to stay alive longer. One of the things that I'm seeing on a lot of different channels is obviously, you know, wearing things and wearing camouflage that helps identify friend from fro. And that's something that's still going to be a hard thing to kind of take a crack at because you want to still pick camouflage that makes sense, that works for you. And all, at the same time, have some way of identifying yourself as f friend from foe. And we're seeing that, you know, like in Ukraine, they got yellow and red duct tape. Like that is going to be a dead giveaway for you because it's a very easy identifiable thing to see if it's friend or foe, but it also gives away you. Like it makes you an easier target. And so this is one of those, those blurry lines that you have to try and fill and think about whenever you're, you know, planning out how you train and planning out your gear or working with your team or working with your community on how you guys are going to come up with a solution for that. So, you know, looking at an Amazon hood, it's a great option. Um, and spray painting any of those highlight spots. And also you can get scrim from anywhere. You can also put a lot of like the paracord tie downs on here to be able to attach vegetation to your Cobra hood. Because of that tradition of hunting that we yep. have here in the States, you also want to have things that lower your signature. So whenever you're, you know, putting a muzzle device on the end of that rifle or you're getting a suppressor, you know, how much signature is that giving off at night? You have to start thinking about those types of things. Do I have a, a light cover for my flashlight? Is that going to, if I ND it, will it, you know, shine? Is, or is that light cover going to kind of help mitigate that mistake? Um, so thinking about, you know, lowering your signature across the board is going to be super important. Also, understand there's going to be tons of technology that's going to be available. I mean, everybody across this industry has got a Beofeng now, you know. But there's also capabilities out there, like I was talking about with, with NC Scout, you know, Brush Beater. Go check out his website. He has tons of flipping radio equipment. And also check out the radio episode that I did with him a couple episodes back. But there's tons of ways to find your radio traffic find the location of where it's coming from and, and triangulate where you're at. So you have to also consider that your radio traffic, if you don't have a form of brevity, if you're not thinking about your SIGINT or your signal intelligence uh, signature, then you're probably going to be found and it's going to give you away. So you have to be thinking about that as well and being smart on maybe doing hand arm signals or having a comm window that you use for contacting your, your base camp and kind of letting them know what's going on. Um, but that's something else that is going to lower and reduce your signature overall. One of the other things that you can do to reduce signatures instead of moving during the day is move at night. And that's going to require night vision. So if you have night vision goggles, what are some ways that you can reduce your signature, maybe avoid fights instead of getting into them? And if you do get into a fight, having the lowest signature possible so that way it's easy for you to be able to break contact and run back off into the darkness. You know, are you fighting a near peer force where they also have night vision and you still need to figure out ways to camouflage yourself to break up that silhouette and not create contrast, which is super important in night vision. And we actually explore that in our night vision class, which we have a night vision class in, in uh, October, where we talk about straight up, we talk about signature and how much signature are you really giving off? Does your camo give off a ton of signature? Does it blend in? Does it break up your silhouette? Does it help lower that contrast? Because contrast is going to be the biggest killer and the biggest de dead giveaway when it comes to finding somebody with night vision and fighting somebody that also has a night vision capability. You want to be able to hide from them still. So, you know, these are some things that we're seeing with technology that you also need to be thinking about whenever you're buying equip equipment, whenever you're buying gear, whenever you're training and you're going out and working with your community or your groups of guys that you, that you train with or gals, you know, thinking about these types of things, how are we going to answer these questions? In the military, within the intel community, we have what's called the most likely course of action and most deadly course of action. So you have to think about what's the worst case scenario in terms of the enemy combatant and also what's the most likely. And like I said in the beginning, I think that marksmanship is going to be something that a lot of people have, you know, even if it takes them a little bit longer, but they still have the basic tools to be able to get the job done, that you need to consider. That that targets being engaged by small arms fire pretty accurately is probably gonna be your most likely course of action you're gonna have to deal with, and you need to develop your training plan and also how you 
put your gear together with that in mind. How do I become a harder target? So these are some things that are some team considerations that I would have as far as if I was working with my group of guys, what would we be training on and what would we be considering a very important task to be able to constantly work at? And for me, it's going to be training at engaging targets at distance. How do I find targets, PIDing those targets, and then having the skill sets to be able to engage those targets very effectively? My other thing is also going to be training on observation, training on can I spot targets 500 yards away or increase my situational awareness and know what to look for so I have the distance, which gives me time, to avoid that situation. When you're walking on patrol, you know, training your eyes to be looking for threats, training constantly, practicing seals, stop, look, listening, and smelling, and understanding what that, what that looks like versus just chilling out and doing a rucksack flop and being like, oh, and just making tons of noise as you're doing that and drinking water. And no, man, like you're going to have to make sure that you have a low signature no matter what. The other thing also is having the ability, like special equipment, a.k.a. thermal. Thermal is going to be huge here. I mean, how many hunters do you know of within your friends group and in your community that hunt pigs or have a thermal scope? Now imagine you can buy thermal, even if it's cheap thermal, you can buy it on Amazon for a few hundred dollars. So now that capability is out there for everybody to be able to have. To include night vision is now becoming a more proliferated piece of equipment that people have. So you need to assume that your enemy has that as well and they have that capability. So how can I hide from that? How can I defeat that technology? Does my team have a thermal that I can use to counter scan my environment before we move? And if I see something that's a thermal signature, waiting and maybe seeing what's going to happen next. Are they going to bypass us? Are, th are we able to bypass them? Can we avoid them? Do they see us? All of these types of things. But that goes back to being able to have my team trained for observation and trained to engage targets at distance. The other thing is going to be, obviously, with that, that being said, that goes hand in hand with that, is intimacy with your weapon system. Having that mindset of one warrior and one sword where you're not constantly you know, playing with all the toys in your collection, but finding what is your main squeeze, what role are you going to fulfill, what type of distance can you engage at, and what's going to make that super easy for you, at the same time being able to engage targets that are closer and being very intimate with your weapon system, understanding everything to and through about that, and also understanding what your role is going to be. What do you bring to the table? You know, I talked about this a couple episodes ago, but having that enabler mindset where you come in bringing a tool set and a capability to the team and then training and building out your kit loadout for that role specifically. One of the other things also is within my team, we want to have a drone. Drones are going to be the future. We're already seeing it right now in Ukraine. We're seeing it being used. I mean, it is such an integral part of the team makeup in Ukraine, and we're seeing it being used as a weapon. We're seeing it being used as a reconnaissance device. We're seeing it being used to gather and create more situational awareness for that team leader or that ground commander. So having that capability as a group is so important. And then designating somebody who will be a drone operator and also have the capability and understanding and knowledge to detect drone activity. Um, it's going to be the important role of the entire team to be able to stop, look, listen, and smell for drones, um, conduct that seals to be able to detect if you're being spotted by drones, but also how to hide from that, how to reduce your signature from that drone. Most of the drones are probably not going to have thermal. Most of them are probably going to have a standard camera. There might be a few that have thermal, but most of them are going to have that standard camera. Now, on a military scale, a lot of those drones, they all have thermal. They all have FLIR. They can all see in thermal. They can all see in, you know, daytime camera. They have that capability. But most of your civilian drones that you're going to see don't have that capability. They have to be purchased separately. So understand, if you can hide from the majority of what drones are going to be out there flying around, then that's what you need to be able to prepare for with also the contingency of the most deadly course of action of being spotted by a drone, which is a drone that is equipped with thermal and equipped with the ability to drop a weapon load. The other thing that I would want my team to have is we would all be running Cobra Hoods in a form where we have the ability to cloak ourselves within our environment, understand if one person on the team gets spotted, there's a high likelihood that the rest of the team may also be spotted or given away. So making sure that you are not the weak link in the chain 
in that group that you also have the ability to hide very well. You understand the basic concepts of camouflage, constantly applying camouflage to your face, to your hands, camouflaging your equipment, spray painting any shine points, spray painting your gun, making sure you have no shine points on there. Uh, and, and making sure that you're doing your due diligence of that personal responsibility of maintaining your own camouflage. But that's going to include everybody on the team having a cobra hood of some sort to be able to hide that head and shoulder silhouette that could give them away. One of the things also that would be important for, for my team would be to have the capability of NVGs. So even if er not everybody on the team has NVGs, maybe somebody has two PVS-14s, then at least have the capability to be able to wear that night vision through by having a helmet and also being able to hand off that night vision unit to somebody else. It's going to be so much more advantageous and such a lower signature that you produce when you travel and do things at night. Yes, there's a lot of gear out there that allows you to see at night. Yes, we have to assume that the enemy will also have the capability to see at night, but it's still going to be a lot less risky than moving during the day. And you're able to move a little bit faster because you're not worried about people, you know, as much as during the day, seeing you and seeing movement and stuff like that. A lot of people are not, still the majority, are not going to have night vision. So you need to train for what the majority is, but also have a contingency plan for the most deadly course of action as well. The other thing that's also going to be important for the team is that everybody has an understanding of how to range targets and range distance whether they have the black hills you know black hills range cards or they have the sobchak security reference cards or they have a range finder or they're they have the ability to be able to look with the bare naked eye and be able to range something out that is such a huge capability that you add to the team by having that as a skill set that you bring because now if you see something that's at you know four o'clock you can give that team leader a, an, a good average estimated range of how far away that is so he can make a decision. Um, also, having that drone is going to help extend the range of how far you can see out so that way you can kind of make good decisions on the fly to avoid maybe you see some hunters in a tree stand and they're setting up an ambush and it's a, and they've, you know, it's a bunch of hunters that are a band of marauders and they're out there trying to prey on the next group that comes across to take all their supplies but you're able to spot them with a drone up in the tree stand. Now you're able to avoid that or make a decision to be able to eliminate that type of threat. So understand that all of these things need to be considered with the understanding that the most likely course of action that you're gonna to have to train for is other marksmen within your environment. Other people being comfortable at engaging targets at distance. And if you're not training engaging targets at distance, finding targets, PIDing targets, ranging things farther out, and being able to engage those threats efficiently, then you're behind the power curve. You're, you're doing yourself a disservice, and you're not also, you know, giving yourself that capability. On the flip side of that coin, it's also going to be very important to be able to engage targets fast. There's going to be times where you may have to engage something that's close and you need to be Johnny on the spot and fast on the gun while, you know, engaging that target that's, that's at a closer distance. All of this being said, at the same time, if you're not training to be safe and you're not safe in your subconscious, meaning you're not just naturally safe by because of your training, training all the time, working that safety, you know, uh, you know, doing things that where you're not a liability to the team. If you're not training that and you're just training all these other skills, but not training safety and, and not flagging your buddies and making sure your safety's always on, your fingers off the trigger, then you're a liability to everybody. So at first, you need to start off with that strong foundation of basic marksmanship, basic fundamentals, and safety to where you don't even think about that anymore. It's just ingrained in your brain so much that it's just a natural reflex. And then you can have the ability to start increasing that time or increasing that speed over time by practicing more and more while being safe and while being effective. So with all that being said, you know, I wanted to rant about this because it's something I've been thinking about for quite a long time. And I was like, man, what would be the most probable thing that in, that produces casualties on the battlefield here in the states and yes there's going to be you know artillery there's going to be tanks there's going to be you know anti-tank weapons there's going to be machine guns there's going to be a lot of that stuff but in my opinion i think based off of the culture and what type of equipment we have here in the states it's going to be a lot of casualties produced by small arms fire 
So you need to be training for how can I be a harder target? How can I engage targets further out so that way I don't have higher risk to myself or to my teammates? And how can I be more effective for my community? Understand that all of this comes through training. You have to invest in yourself. If you have a limited budget and you're like, well, I can either buy all this gear or I can go out and spend some money on ammo and go train, spend the money on ammo and go train. Go out and get the the training in, get the skill sets in now, and then slowly accumulate that gear because then after you do all that training, you're going to figure out what you need and what you don't need and not waste a lot of money and time and resources. So make sure that you're going out and you're getting your training. Like I said, you, we have training classes. You know, we have scope carbon courses. We have a gas gun match that's going to help you test your abilities and your skills. We have night vision courses. We have rifle and pistol courses. All of these courses are important towards making you a better shooter and a more effective asset to the people in your community and your family and your team. But also, with that being said, there's tons of other training companies that are really good companies that are out there that you can get training from. So if you have the ability, go out and get not just training, but get good training from very good instructors. Um, there's a lot of snake oil out there that will try to be sold to you. If it smells funny and looks funny, it's probably funny. So make sure you get good training from competent instructors that are truly invested in making you a better shooter and not just stroking their own ego. So, you know, you guys can go check out. We have a video about how to vet your trainers and kind of look in that further back in the channel where we talk about that. But all this being said, you want to be an asset to everybody around you, not so that way you can go out and just dominate and conquer, but so that way when society collapses and people are going to be in need, people are going to have a loss of hope, there's going to be people that are, have no shelter, that are going to be starving, that are going to have no protection, that are going to be vulnerable, and you can be the person that can provide them that protection, provide them that safety, that can give them shelter, that can feed the hungry and provide hope for the hopeless. If you are trained to be an asset, you will have the ability to bless so many people. And it starts within your heart. It starts with inside of you. And there's a verse that I want to read to you from First Chronicles. And it is so important. This is something that God has called for all of us. And if you have the heart of the Lord, and if you have that heart of compassion, you will be a warrior for him. You understand that Jesus was called the angel of the commander of the armies of heaven? He is a warrior's soul. He has a warrior's heart to and through, but he also has a heart that is loving. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecy, prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. If you are an asset, there's going to be so many people that are going to rely on you, that need you to be on your A-game, that need someone to protect them. There's going to be children that are without their parents. There's going to be widows. There's going to be elderly. There's going to be people who are helpless that are going to need you to stand up, to do what's right, to help provide hope for those who are lost. And then once you provide them shelter and security and food and feed the hungry, then you can provide them the real hope that can actually fill the gaping hole with inside of all of us. And that is the gospel of Jesus and the love of Jesus Christ. And only he can fulfill you. Only he can give you true purpose without having any wrongdoing in your heart or in your mind. And so, guys, we train, we talk about training, we talk about gear, so that way you can be capable to bless those who need hope, to bless those when society falls and everything collapses and all hope is lost. 
we have the key and the good news of the true hope that God and Jesus can provide to you. And so if you don't know who Jesus is and you have a gaping hole in your life, get a hold of us. Email us at team at barrelandhatchet.com. Talk to us. We'd love to talk to you and pray with you and send us, send us an email. If you are a Christian who is going through a hard time or you're going through a rough season, email us, team at barrelandhatchet.com. Get a hold of us. We'd love to talk to you and pray with you and, and, and fellowship with you and help you to get through that season together with the Lord. And so guys, Make sure you're always training to be the asset. You're always looking out to provide hope and love other people, loving your neighbor as yourself, providing for your fellow man, trained to be the eternal asset. And I will see you on the next one. Thank you.